Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. Here on Brave UX though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Dan Brown. Dan is the co-founder and principal of 8Shapes, a user experience consultancy based in the Washington DC area, whose clients have included large enterprises such as Capital One, 3M and Sprint, as well as tech giants such as Google, eBay and Cisco. Since 1994, Dan has focused on helping organizations to discover and define their digital products, understand their users better through research, and to shape the information architecture, content strategy, and interaction design of complex systems. He is a critical thinker and a generous contributor to the UX community, regularly sharing his thoughts on Medium and speaking at events such as UX New Zealand, UX Lisbon, Enterprise UX, the Interaction Conference, and Confab. Dan is the creator of Surviving Design Projects, a game that helps teams to improve their conf conflict management skills, as well as the incredibly useful information architecture lenses, a deck of cards that helps designers to interrogate their IA in different ways. He is also the author of three books, Communicating Design, Designing Together, and Practical Design Discovery all of which are widely considered to be essential reading for UX designers looking to communicate, collaborate, and practice design more effectively. Today, it's my great pleasure, you guessed it, to be speaking with Dan on Brave UX. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here, Dan. And I have a, a little bird that told me that you're a big fan of tabletop games. Yes, that is an was understatement. Correct. Yes. yes. I understand, as I, as I mentioned in your intro, you even created your own tabletop game. And this isn't really a world that I know very much about. I mean, when I was a kid, I did collect magic cards. So I do have to put my hand up for that. I mean, okay. Magic the Gathering. Okay. And I also once played a game of Star Wars Rebellion that nearly ended up in my relationship with my brother-in-law ending in tears. But other wow. than that, yeah, it was pretty intense. Other than that, I'm a complete novice. Usually when that happens to me, when someone's in tears, they're not an adult. Like it's it's usually <laughs> one of my kids. But yeah, so I've played I've played Rebellion. That is a brutal, vicious game. So I can understand. It, it went over two days. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. It took us two days. The final roll was on the floor and there were knees and there were fists in the air and there was like almost yeah. a almost a scream that was let out. It was pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about tabletop games for you? Why do you love them so much? Oh, well, let's just divide the world of tabletop games into two uh, spheres. There are board games like we've been and card games like we've been uh, talking about, right? These are interesting systems, right? And they're systems by through which we uh, follow rules to achieve an outcome. And as a designer, uh, I see myself as someone who designs uh, systems, not necessarily design systems, right? But as an information architect, someone who creates structures in which uh, information and users need to uh, inhabit the same space. And I see it as a, a real parallel uh, to the work or engaging in that way because it's similar to the work that I do. But the other sphere is uh, role-playing games. Um, so obviously the most famous of these is Dungeons and Dragons, but there are many, many, many kinds of role-playing games. Uh, and I've been playing RPGs since I was a kid. The hobby has really ballooned a lot since then. And there are all kinds of games now that kind of occupy that that space. And what I love about them is that unlike many board games, there is a collaborative creative element to role-playing games where we are working together to tell a story. If that isn't a good description of the design process, I don't know what is. And so I find a lot of value and parallels in that work uh, in my work, as well as in playing those games. 
but I also just find them fun. I just love, I love the process of sitting down with usually my children uh, to kind of occupy this world that the game creates uh, for us uh, and to see what happens, right? It's a, it's a great way of uh, exercising the brain, watching your children um, sort of do some problem solving uh, on the fly um, and, and just kind of interact with someone in a, in a structured way, I guess. So. And it seems you, you mentioned that um, you saw design as a, as a way of working together to tell a story. It mm -hmm. seems like you felt that designers were having difficulty doing that and that inspired you to create surviving design projects. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think there's a myth as that one might hold as a as a someone seeking to enter the design field, that as a designer you will sit at your desk and you will move boxes around on a screen all day long, uh, or that occasionally you will get up and go for a walk because that's what everyone says you need to do when you need inspiration, right? <laughs> but 90% of your work is interacting with someone else. It's either to get feedback on the work, to gather requirements for the work, to coordinate activities because, you know, the project is too big for you to do by yourself. So there's any number of reasons why you're interacting with other people. And this is not something they teach in design school. So I created surviving design projects because the more projects I worked on, the more I realized that I was seeing the same kinds of situations over and over and over again, and that I had sort of built up a toolbox of things that I do to help navigate or mitigate uh, those uh, situations. And there wasn't a simple recipe, right? There isn't like, well, my client is getting distracted by shiny objects. So I'm going to always bring out this tool, right? The tool the what I call the patterns really varied depending on myriad of circumstances. And so the best thing I could do was build up as many of those patterns as I could. So I could evaluate what would be most appropriate given the situation, given the players involved, given what I was trying to achieve in this situation. Uh, and so surviving design projects came around where I was like, okay, well, I've got catalog of situations that I deal with on projects and I've got this toolbox and my work often involves evaluating a situation to understand how do I navigate through this and selecting the right tool for that job. And by then I was already playing, it was like 2012. And by then I was already playing lots of card games and board games. Uh, and so I use uh, apples to apples as a really well-known kind of party game. Uh, and I use that as the framework for the project or for the, for the uh, game. So. so your personal and professional worlds kind of dovetailed together there. You know, it sounds like a lot of work to create a tabletop game like Sur Surviving Design Projects. Was it more work or more difficult than you expected when you first started? Um, I don't remember. I don't think so. I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and you'd think that question would occur to me before I start these things. <laughs> and I surround myself with very responsible, smart people. And I say to them things like, I'm going to design a card game. And they say to me, that's crazy. And I say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So, I mean, everything is more work when you want to do it well, right? Everything is more work than you think it's going to be. I think what I found surprising about that process was, and again, this is going to sound ridiculous, was how important testing was. So I got, at the time, I got some of my teammates from Eight Shapes to come over to my house and play the game a bunch. And I just watched them uh, play the game. I was literally usability testing the game. And I realized how important that process was because it provoked, as simple as the game is, it provoked some interesting changes, things that I thought about in terms of how to write the rules and how to run the game. You know, I ended up running the game a lot in workshops, so how I ran the game in workshops, things like that. So it just validated the idea that we need to do testing of our products, which again, as a user experience professional, is something I should know already. So. Well, it's great to hear that you did a, did apply the uh, one of the techniques or plays that we all talk about in the field yeah. to the creation of your own game, and that it was was of value. Yes, you know, Dan, you you strike me, given what I know about you and what I've seen, that you're a bit of a master at externalizing your thinking. Now, I was curious about this trait 
that you have, you know, you, it's evident in, in the game that we were just talking about and what you like to do and some of the other things that you've done, including writing books. Did you write a journal or did you draw as a child? I was curious, where did this, this need to externalize your thinking come from? That's a great question. I think there's some interesting directions that we could go there. I think I have two chronic illnesses and I was diagnosed with one when I was six and the other when I was 15. And when you're that young, you don't know why these things happen to you and you don't know a world without them, right? So these are very much a part of my identity, but in order to process them, I felt like I needed to express myself and I didn't have good venues for doing that, but what I, the way it expressed itself was sort of trying to explain how the world works or, you know, whatever sort of model I had concocted as a kid for how people have a soul or how people uh, experience each other or, and I would diagram these things uh, out. Um, and I see that now as a person, uh, a middle-aged man, I see this as a means by which I was trying to make sense of the complicated things that were happening to me. I don't like having these conditions, but at the same time, they've given me tools that I can use to maybe do a little tiny bit of good, if not in the world, then in our industry. And that is to sort of think is to the the idea of self reflection comes very naturally to me, uh, self awareness comes very naturally to me because of these things that I was dealing with uh, throughout my life, and so by being self reflective, I can then sort of I I think what I try and do is then translate the things that I'm thinking about to make them tangible or meaningful uh, to other folks. Mm, and and the direct sort of output or, or product or outcomes from your own self-reflection and need to make sense of the world has obviously led to a wonderful career and a field that really embraces those skills that you've got. But you've also, you're trying to help other people in design to have the same practice of self-reflection. Is this a practice that you feel that the field is in need of more? Or is it something that you feel like it's part of your mission to help us as designers to embrace and, and adapt that into our own way of working? I mean, I think that the field needs, that designers need to, to develop the capacity to reflect on themselves and their work, full stop. Whether I think there's ever enough of that is irrelevant, right? Because there's always the capacity, uh, there's always an, a need to reflect more. There's always a need to examine our work more. In the 90s, we thought we were doing a pretty good job. And here we are 20 years later, realizing just how screwed up the world is because of some of the design decisions that we've been making over the years. So one of the things I think that again, another myth might be that people think there's an end to self-reflection, but it is a practice that you will need for the rest of your design career. And the sooner you cultivate it, I think the more successful you can be as a designer. I wonder if, I guess I'm sort of a hopeless optimist, right? So part of me thinks that with a greater capacity for self-reflection, we might not have been in the position that we are in today with sort of some of the harm that modern technologies have caused in the world. And there's, there's definitely a, a, a big rabbit hole we could go down there. Before we, we do go down that, I wanted to bring you back to your childhood. You mentioned these conditions that you were diagnosed with, and this is where your self-reflection and your need to externalize your thinking came from. Yeah. If you put yourself back in that, Teen, those teenage years of yours where you were using self-reflection and externalization of thinking, what was it that practice gave you personally at that time of your life? I think there's a need to put complicated things into words that uh, other people can find accessible. By going through that process, we take thoughts in our heads that are 
complex, right? That are sort of inherently complex. And we try and break them down and make them accessible for other people. I'm experiencing, you know, X, Y, and Z. How do I articulate that in a way that someone will understand it, maybe empathize a little bit with me, but also maybe help me too, right? Uh, and by, by uh, creating these frameworks, creating these vocabularies that are accessible to other uh, people, we can create a shared experience. So even though you are not experiencing the same illnesses that I am, you are experiencing other things that maybe bring uh, these feelings out, that brings this kind of self-reflection out, right? And a shared vocabulary, which is one of the outcomes of externalizing your internal world, that shared vocabulary builds that bridge between us. I mean, both of my parents are teachers too. And so I can't, I can't discount that, that I grew up in a home that prioritized education. And I mean, uh, I'm in a profession that neither of them could really, neither of my folks could have imagined. And what I see is a direct line between the work that I do today and the work that they were doing when I was a kid as educators, as storytellers, as people who are responsible for helping other folks internalize uh, certain ideas. And so I think that part of that externalization comes from that instinct as well that I got from, from that particular uh, aspect of my childhood. I get the sense that your house must have had quite a few books available. Uh, you would think, but well, they're not big readers. My dad, not a big reader. <laughs> so my dad is a, a film professor. So we watched mm -hmm. a lot of weird movies when I was a kid. Thinking about what you said earlier about the state of big technology and some of the decisions that were made in the 90s, let's come back to that. And you've been doing this for a wee while now. By my count, it's about 25 or 26 years. Yeah. I wanted to get a sense from you looking back on that time in the field, what have been some of the things that we have forgotten as a field that we discovered earlier on that we, that we're, we've lost in our practice and that we need to be reminded of? Oh, that's an interesting uh, perspective. I'm not sure I would have taken that perspective, but I mean, the thing that I, I see uh, or, or the thing that I don't see, one of the things I don't see, uh, is information architecture, right? I, I will show up on design teams and they've got incredibly talented designers, like folks who can, you know, produce a set of mock-ups in Figma, work collaboratively, work effectively with developers, like all the things that we prize uh, today. But, you know, the, the navigation will just be this hodgepodge of, of menu items. And I'm like, why did, why, why does that get the short shift there? And so I think there is, I think we have long discounted the value of deep thinking about structural problems. Were we better at it back then? I don't know. This field was smaller. So maybe it was easier to sort of, for, for we information architects to be louder uh, about it. The IA conference, formerly the IA summit, has always been just one of my favorite events. Um, but even that has become, I think, out of necessity, this is not a knock, but um, not strictly about information architecture anymore. And so we see fewer and fewer people um, engaged in that, the complexity around underlying structures, and which is a shame because the products are getting complicated and their reach is getting further. And so there is an increased need uh, for these things. Yeah, that's interesting. And I asked you about what we're not doing that we were doing earlier. And you've obviously raised IA as an example of something that's fallen by the wayside, you know, the ability to really think about the structural components of what it is that we're creating. But I, I, I'm drawing, going to draw a line here between what I believe you were touching on when you first raised this topic, which was some of the errant decision making that right. has led to some of the abominations that we've ended up creating and the social side effects of those. And we don't need to name names unless you want to. But that seems to me to be somewhat as a result of not being enough, uh, critical enough in our thinking about some of those structural things that we were putting in place and what they might lead to, which could be easy to look back on and, and say, oh, it's evident that because we didn't do A, we ended up with B. What, what are your thoughts on 
the role of IA and that deep critical thinking and how that may or may not have helped to shape the world in a different way if we'd been more deliberate in its practice? Well, I'm going to, I'll start there, but I kind of want to shift it because I, I do think that with information architecture comes a certain amount of critical thinking, right? Thinking deeply about the kinds of connections and relationships uh, that are that are being made. So I do think information architecture um, plays a role in that. But I think what's missing is something that has never, ever been present, which is this, and it's hard for me to articulate this as a middle-aged white man, a notion of the way other people experience technology, right? The way people who don't look like us or have our same uh, background experience technology and experience social technologies, if we're, you know, being very specific. And that, as long as we've been using the E word empathy, I think uh, has, it's always been lip service. And it is not something that I think has ever really been sufficiently present I love seeing some of the dialogue that's happening today. It is hard and it is challenging and it is, it can be painful. But for me, that helps me recognize that there is an opportunity for growth, at least in me, to recognize what's been missing from my process all along. Or what's what is that? What has challenged you? What have you realized that's been missing? I think there's a, and again, I don't feel qualified to talk about these things because I am sort of part of the problem in a sense, right? I am a person who has spoken about the uh, value of user-centered design without really understanding necessarily what that could possibly entail. I haven't really thought deeply about the recruiting practices that we use when we recruit for user research studies, right? And my attitude has always been something is better than nothing, right? Any user voice is better than no user voice, right? Any feedback that I get on my design is better than no feedback on my design. But I think even now I am coming to understand that any is not good enough, right? Any is any feedback or any input or any outcome of a discovery process is still not good enough to fully capture and create a foundation for building meaningful experiences until we've spoken to a sufficient, not, a, not even a sufficient, again, I don't have the right words, but a, a better representation of the range of people who will make use of our products. Yeah, this is a, a huge topic. And and like you, I'm not really that qualified to, to speak on it. But I do wonder what you've observed as a consulting UXer from the internal teams that you've worked with. You, know, you talked earlier on about creating uh, surviving design, the game, as a result of pattern matching the problems that you saw right. inherent with the engagements that you'd had as a consulting UXer. So if we if we think about that, and then we apply this back to this bigger topic of diversity and inclusion that we're touching on here, you know, what are the positive signs or the gaps, maybe the negative things that you're, you're still seeing internal teams wrestle with to try and do the best they can to, to, to uh, address this issue? Yeah. I mean, I can still see homogenous design teams and that is just depressing uh, to me. I don't know if it's depressing because I grew up in Manhattan, you know, where I was sort of always surrounded by people who were very different from me, or most of my working life, I've lived in the Washington DC area, which is not perfect, but it is a very diverse city with lots going on here. And so I always feel very uncomfortable in very homogenous areas. And even earlier this year, I felt like I was uh, on a client where um, there was there was some lip service paid uh, to diversity and inclusion, but it was not adequately represented. The teams that I feel like operate best are those with a broad inclusion of varying folks at varying levels in the uh, organization as well. So folks, you know, who are work, working designers and folks who are at the management level. And the other red flag, honestly, that I see is siloed design teams, like design teams that if this is not just about sort of uh, race and ethnicity and uh, gender and uh, sexuality and all these things. It's literally just, do you have different perspectives of people 
participating in the design process uh, because they're the ones who have to build it or they're the ones who are going to have to use it or whatever it is. Uh, and I just feel like I still show up in design teams that are heavily siloed from other areas of the organization. Just to change gears a little bit, one of the things that I have been seeing is product managers, more product managers, right? Some of those product managers are based are come out of the business side. So they don't really have a good handle on how to build product, but they have a good handle on the business. And I've been on both sides of the fence here in terms of, I find these folks incredibly refreshing. And on the other hand, I find it incredibly frustrating that they don't know how to manage product. But at the end of the day, I feel like they are, they represent a opportunity to break down some of these silos. Is that through their sort of f fresh pair of eyes that they bring? Yeah, I think there's the fresh pair of eyes. I think it's just their their perspective coming out of the business side. They've got a different set of connections than we on the implementation side, right? the, we on the building side. Coming out of the business side, they've got other connections, other perspectives that they're bringing, bringing to the table. And they have, they presumably, at least on paper, have a capacity to break down some of those silos. Yeah, and silos are a problem in any enterprise, and there's no getting around it. That design at scale within the enterprise is definitely challenging. Right. Plenty of shades of grey, lots of politics, and as you would probably know, being an external as I am, lots of painful inefficiencies that go on right. in large businesses. You know, whether we're in house or consulting. It's a rare thing that we get to do design in the way in which it's written in the books that we read, oh, yeah. right? There's sort of like, there's not the perfect. It doesn't really no. exist. How do you keep a positive mindset and moving forward for so long? You know, you've done this for 25 years now in a business world that seems to be constantly trying to revert to a mean of mediocrity. <laughs> wow, that's good. I think my mantra to now this something is better than nothing is what sort of keeps me going and what i've found painful is it's the thing that's allowed me to progress it's the thing that's allowed me to feel okay about where i've landed in certain things and now that i'm questioning it that's where the pain comes in but i still feel like there's if 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 by something i mean doing no harm is is a little thing that I can do, then I, I think I have to feel at least somewhat satisfied with the work. But I've always said that the curse of being designer is being perpetually dissatisfied, right? The, the whole idea of our work is iteration and sort of trying to find ways to make the world a, a even slightly marginally better place, right? That's just sort of inherent to the field. So because of that, I relish small wins, uh, but I don't feel like I can rest my laurels entirely upon them. Thinking about that do no harm and your practice of self-reflection, what are the sort of things that you ask yourself before you take on an engagement or that you assess through an engagement oh, yeah. about the potential for harm that your work could be contributing to? What does that conversation look like? That's a great question. I mean, clearly the nature of the type of client is, you know, the industry uh, that they're in is really top of mind uh, for us. So no, no nuclear weapons manufacturers then? <laughs> um, I'm in the DC area, so I can't say <laughs> one way or the other whether that's true or not. Um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, I think also sort of the kind of work that the individual team uh, is, is trying to do. And so even in a large financial client, whatever one's misgivings are about the financial industry, maybe there's some bit of good uh, that, that can be done. And I think also I am trying to assess to what extent I will have, I will be satisfied with this work. That is to say, it will be personally rewarding or professionally rewarding to me insofar as, you know, the things that I look for are ability to make some kind of change, right? Ability to have some kind of impact. Because if I am not feeling that, then I don't feel like I will be able to do uh, any good. 
you know, as I listen to myself say these things out loud, um, which is a skill that one I think needs to cultivate if one is doing self-reflection, you know, there's that small part of me that's listening to me say these things out loud. And it's still sort of, these things are still laced threaded with an incredible amount of uh, privilege, right? Being able to pick and choose my work, looking at a company and being able to me, little old me assess whether they can or should or will do good in the world. Who am I to really understand what harm a company may or may not do? It's these are the kinds of things that I feel like I will be wrestling with for the rest of my career. Well, who are you not to though, given the state of the world and and also just thinking about this, it's reminded me of a conversation that I had with Peter Morville and also with Uday Gajenda. And both of the, these gentlemen touched on this notion that design itself is actually a political act. Right. How do you feel about that? Oh, yeah. I just tweeted the other day um, at Andy Budd that, I, that all design is political. Not that he was disagreeing with that, but he was sort of making a statement and I sort of built up upon that statement. If a designer doesn't understand that, then I don't think they really understand design, right? I think design is not, design can sometimes feel like making a lot of compromises, but there's still a voice that comes out of the product that we're designing. That that product still has, still expresses an opinion, is still assertive about what it believes and what it wants. And maybe I'm anthropomorphizing products too much, but come on, that's what they do. They express an opinion. Uh, and if they didn't, then we wouldn't see them ever change. But even just watching Amazon's, Amazon.com sort of change over time, even watching Twitter's change over time, you can see it trying to express itself differently. And those expressions are laced with opinion, right? Have something to say uh, about, about the world and how, what they think about you, uh, the user, when it engages in a dialogue with you. Hundred mm, percent. I mean, it's they're the result of a thousand or potentially a million different just small decisions that have been made. And I get the sense that even if designers aren't aware of it, or even if they're actively abstaining from thinking about their work as having a political impact in the world through the things that they are creating, that's still an, in itself as a political statement. Right. Abstaining as a political statement, no doubt. Yes. Let's come back to the practice of dealing with you know, what I think you described as a, a series of compromises that you have to make in, in, in terms of getting things done in design. What battles have you found that you needed to fight and which battles have you found over time and through experience that you're willing to let go to maintain that sort of bigger picture that you're working to? That's a hard question for me to answer, um, but I will be um, transparent. And it's hard because I can't think of a design or a, a sort of a design related battle that I've ever been super passionate about. What I get passionate about more than design, I think, than the outcomes of design is the process of design. The outcomes, even though we've just had this long conversation about how problematic they can be if you make irresponsible decisions, my passion has always been, are we going about this? the right way. Because again, the hopeless optimist in me says, if we use, if we engage the right process, the outcomes, if not perfect, will be understandable. Uh, and so the hills that I choose to die on are not about a particular design decision, but are about how we go about it. And I don't know what has changed in me over time, but my attitude towards those process conversations have been less about, I'm going to make an argument and I intend to win it and more, I'm going to just help you understand what these decisions will mean. So let's just do a simple one, right? If we choose uh, to do a recruit and we don't invite uh, and, we, and we sort of aren't deliberate about who we invite to that recruit, uh, then we're going to face these risks, right? We're going to get a very skewed set of feedback from that. And ultimately, maybe it's not up to me who we recruit, how we do the recruit, but I do think it is my responsibility to communicate 
what the risks are, document what the risks are, so that the people who are responsible for making that decision are working with a complete set of information or as complete that I can I can make it for them. I get the sense that you feel like our reliance on processes like the double diamond, we've become overly dog dogmatic in that and that that's led to some intellectual laziness about some of the critical things that you've just touched on there about who do we recruit and what the impact of those decisions may be by just referring back to our way of working as we've always done it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I do a lot of cooking and I do most of my cooking without a recipe. And, and I think, well, I haven't been fired yet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's my kids will complain about my cooking and I'm like, friends, there's only one person at this table I need to impress, and her name is Sarah. And if she's happy, I don't care what the rest of you think. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's my wife. And that kind of cooking is all about course correction, is all about I'm picturing the goal, I know where I want to end up, and then imagining the process you need to get there. And as things go wrong, oh, the pan was too hot, or oops, I put too much butter in, or whatever it is, like course correcting to make sure that you can still arrive at an approximate destination. And that's, in my mind, almost a perfect metaphor for the design process, because you never know what's going to go wrong, right? You can, you can have sort of your perfect process outlined, and then when you try and recruit users, you get nobody right or you get the the executive coming in right in the middle of that second diamond uh and you've never seen them before and they're like oh i hate all of this right you never know what's going to happen right and so and it's a creative process so i like thinking about the design process not in terms of any particular prescribed recipe but in terms of how am i going to uh, at any given moment, what decisions do I need to make and what's the right decision given the information that I have? Yeah, and I understand that you've framed this up in terms of mindsets and that there are several mindsets as creative people, designers would benefit from holding. You've suggested that there are uh, two two main categories of these and I'd love to dive into collaborative mindsets with you first, sure. which you've, fr you've framed as adaptive, collective, and assertive. That's I want to start with adaptive. Yeah. Well, well, you did say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, did, so my notes tell me that you did and I did watch you talk <laughs> about I it. I believe so. you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with adaptive. This one's about changing what you're doing if what you're doing isn't working. And that's exactly what you've just described. It's sort of the conditions have changed. So what do I then do? What decisions do I then make? Right. Now, that is something that when we're talking about that, that sounds really easy to do. And I think people would understand that intellectually. If something's not working, stop doing it. But we as humans suffer from a number of different biases, one of which is I think this is a bias, sunk cost fallacy, yeah. which is basically like we've spent so much time walking down this let's road. Just, let's just keep going. Yep. Let's just keep going, regardless yep. of what the new information is. And there's also this political nature of the organization where there's a bit of losing face and just how safe is it for me to go, you know what, I was wrong or things have changed and now we need a bunch more budget to go down this different road. Yep. How can we as designers become more brave in recognizing when things have changed and and to make better decisions, even though it might be really difficult? Arrived at multiple answers to that question. I will start with the last one I thought of, which is I think or I aspire to always ask myself, why am I doing what I'm doing right now? And if I don't have a good answer for that question, then I have to change course. Why am I churning out all of these wireframes, even though we just got some feedback that, you know, they, they want to go in a different direction or why, why am I churning out all of these? Why am I running this usability test, even though I don't really have goals uh, for what I want to get out of this? Why am I doing these things? Because like, this is a certain amount of reaction to bootcamp kind of mentality that, that we're seeing a lot in UX these days where rote processes are taught and I don't, I don't know how much critical thinking is, comes along with that, uh, with those processes. But 
as soon as I'm able to ask myself why and give myself an honest answer, I feel more confident in then going, you know what, this is not working. Let's, let's try something else. So I think that's, that's at least one sort of mechanism that we can use to help us course correct, which is not something I use in cooking. So the metaphor kind of falls apart there, but here we are. That's right. It's not about being perfect. Right. No. <laughs> something else. One of the other mindsets was this, this notion of um, the collective and that's definitely a conventional wisdom that design is a team sport and it's better done with others. Are there any exceptions to that though in design? You know, are there any areas of design where having an individual mindset actually leads to better outcomes? Uh, no, uh, but I, <laughs> I would add some nuance, which is only that you don't have to do everything with someone else. Right. There are, are some moments in which sometimes you just need to sit and think about something. And I, I've just uh, wrapped up interviewing a lot of information architects. And this is one of the lines of questioning I had, which was, OK, we know we sh should collaborate with people, but I sometimes you just need to sit and think about it. What does that look like? And it was really interesting to me that very few people could answer that question, that it was always about bringing in someone else. And I mean, we can dive into that, but, uh, but I know for myself, sometimes I just need to sit and look at the problem or sit and dwell on the problem. And no doubt I will draw someone else in to validate or no doubt I will draw someone else in to bounce something off of. Sometimes I think my role as a design lead is just to sit there and let someone else talk about their work out loud because you hear it differently when you say it out loud. You, you experience your own work differently when you do it out loud, which again is something you can do by yourself, but is better when you're talking <laughs> to someone uh, about it. So I do think there is there are moments in the design process that are somewhat solitary, but we can't just leave it there, right? That's, that's not the be all and end all. Yeah, it's not, it sort of runs counter to the common culture at the moment of meetings and workshops and busy work. You know, where do we, when do we get that time and how do we make that time to actually do as Dan suggested and, and as you've suggested and take that, um, take that space, think. you know? Yeah. yeah sit, sit and think. Sit, it's sit such a think. luxury. Yeah it, yeah, it really is. I mean, it, it, you, when you were just talking, it just made me think about Figma, right? And Figma is sort of the hot design tool now. And part of the appeal of Figma is that it is, it is collaborative from the ground up, right? It started out as something where I could see your cursor moving in my Figma file, which is great, right? There's no doubt that that is definitely a plus over many of the other solutions out there. But it also sort of implies from the ground up, meaning that every part of this process is collaborative. Every spreadsheet that I create is in the cloud, right? And shared with someone else, right? And that spreadsheet has my brainstorming about categories. Every mirror board is in the cloud and designed to be shared with someone else, even though it's got sort of a brain dump of whatever I'm thinking about uh, the design problem. I'm not saying we should create walls in those spaces. I think that would make me a little bit of a hypocrite, but the mindset of collectiveness is built in and I think we don't, because of that, maybe we don't give ourselves permission to sit, to turn that off and just say, let me sit and think for a second so I can process what I'm dealing with, either intellectually, like I'm trying to solve a problem, or emotionally. That was a really hard user interview, and I need to just sit and deal with it for a second before I move on to my next one. Yeah, there's definitely some tension there. I can't remember the company, and it's probably, there's a few of them, but it's one of the big ones. It might be Amazon, where you're not actually allowed to turn up to a meeting unless you've sat with the materials that have been prepared right. for that meeting and formed your own point of view to discuss at the meeting. I think that's that recognition that, you know, coming in, uh, half prepared and not really having had the time to think about what might be critical decisions that you're making on your own actually do the the collective a a disservice so, yeah it's hmm. i i mean i find that a little bit frustrating 
too, because I feel like that can be arbitrary, uh, is, is smacks a bit of gatekeeping, right? Of, well, if you didn't have the time to sit and read this 20 page report, then I don't really care what your opinion is. And that's baloney, right? Every, I still value other people's perspectives. And especially in this day and age, I forgive you for not doing the homework. Like, I haven't done the homework all the, like I don't, I don't do the homework hundred percent of the time, but I still want to have a voice. I still want to be able to contribute to the conversation. And if God forbid, my opinion is ill-informed, well, I can just get in line between the 7 billion other people on this planet who have uh, uninformed opinions about things. Like it's just the nature of humanity to sometimes show up, have an opinion about something, but give us space to talk about it, right? Give us space to consider a topic critically. These are not simple topics. Sometimes I do my best thinking here on a podcast when I have to be spontaneous and just think <laughs> out loud, right? That, that is not, this, these are not ideas that would have come up had I just turned to medium and started writing something, right? My, my brain works differently. So, wow, that was a soapbox. Well, I love it. I feel like I struck a nerve there and you were yeah, rather like, assertive, <laughs> which brings hour, us to, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's speaking of assertive, you know, that's a word that that's a mindset that you've proposed as well. Yeah. And that is a word that can bring up some mixed feelings for people. It, it yeah. can sort of verge on overconfidence or, or arrogance, sort of what comes to mind or well, for me at least. So it's in a, the context of a, a fine line. Yeah. There's yeah. So, yeah. Well, let's explore that fine line in the context of design. What does it mean to be assertive in a positive sense? I think, I think it means having an opinion, right? And, you know, showing up and, and I struggle with this. This is the one I struggle with the most because sometimes I look at something and I'm like, I really don't care. I'm sorry. I'm trying. I'm trying to care, but I really don't. And what's That's when you find yourself catching those yawns when you're trying not to yawn with your mouth open. You get those in meetings. <laughs> it's not that I'm bored. It's just that I don't, I literally don't, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the right person to render an opinion about this or, or my opinion is not grounded in anything, especially meaningful. Right. So I, I can sometimes look at something and go, I really don't care. And this is ironic because I live with very opinionated people who have You're from New York, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, none of them are, none of the people I live with are, but, but strangely, they all have very strong opinions specifically about my cooking, which, you know, now that we come back to that, maybe <laughs> anyway, but I feel like the, you know, where this one came from is I will work with designers who I think are very talented and, and just really good at what they do. And then they get into a conversation and they become order takers. And my heart breaks a little bit for those folks because I'm like, part of the process is being assertive, not just about what you think is the right direction, but asking questions, like not taking anything for granted. I think if I can find a better word, then maybe a better word for this is whatever is encapsulated in not taking anything for granted, not taking anything at face value, so that when you get critique, when you get someone kind of pounding on your design, your instinct should not be, no, this it's my way or the highway, or no, uh, sure, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. It's, well, help me understand why you think that's the case or help me understand why you think this is broken, right? Being assertive, it means in this case, not simply just accepting what someone is telling you, but trying to dig underneath it to understand it better. And that really pairs well with this creative mindset, uh, the second category where the first creative mindset was curious yeah. and it's fair to say if you're a designer and you're not curious, you're probably not going to be a very good designer. But a lot of people, designers of which are not immune to this, have this fear of not having the right answer. And there's a lot of negative baggage that we carry. Mm. My suspicion is that comes from a lot of our formal education that we've had and the way in which we've learned to learn. You're an expert 
And you've had 25 years of experience doing what you're doing. You've written books about it. You've spoken all around the world on information architecture and UX. Surely, after all that time, there's not much you haven't seen by now. Oh, that's not true. That was a total setup, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I thank you for that, but <laughs> it was a little on the nose. No, I mean, I, I think what what I get intrigued about is not design process or I'm I've, so first of all, I'm inherently curious about uh, domains. Like uh, one of my big clients uh, deals with licensing architects in the U.S. It is as niche as you can get, and I have been engaged with that client for ten years. And I am learning something new every day with them. And I love it. I love how, whatever the implicate, you know, economic and political implications of, the, of it are, but however, you, however you might feel about licensing professionals, I am downright fascinated by all the esoteric stuff to the point where one of my teammates who is doing research on this will message me little obscure bits of trivia that she finds because she knows I find it so entertaining and engaging. So, so domains. So it's become, it's become your muse. The domain has become your muse. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'm just genuinely curious about how do people do work in this? Like how, how, do, how does X work? How does pharmaceutical industry work? Like, I'm just genuinely curious about that. I am also genuinely curious about the perspectives that people bring to the table. So I love working with other designers and I like watching them solve problems in the way, and this is not meant to be patronizing in the way I like watching my kids play board games, right? In the way I like watching a mind that I care about, right? Cause I have affection for people I work with. I care about those folks and I'm genuinely interested in watching them wrestle with a problem. I find that really uh, engages my curiosity. Hey, people are fascinating. Yes, that's what my therapist says. So that's what I think too. So, yeah, humans. Just are, for the record, I'm not Dan's therapist. No. In case anyone was wondering. Though, <laughs> so, I mean, you could start charging me, and I would feel. I mean, I feel like we're being very productive. Like it's been a good session. So I'll send you a link to my uh, Stripe after the after the session. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> this uh, look. The second uh, mindset that you came up with that would help designers in terms of being a creative mindset was skepticism. And I love, I love that you've included skepticism here. And it's kind of like assertive and the collaborative yeah. mindsets where it can polarize people when you first hear this word, especially when it comes to some pretty topical things that are going on now related to the right. pandemic. Right. What does positive skepticism, again, in the context of design look like? And how do you deploy that tactfully in a team setting without being seen as a buzz killer? Right. Yeah. And I, I think what's, it, I'm really glad that you highlighted that these sort of are in different categories. Like my collaborative mindsets emerged first, right? That was the first thing I wrote about. And assertive is very much about the connections to other people that you're working with, right? Is to assertive means you have a voice and I care about it, right? And that voice might be expressing a strong opinion about a direction that we should be going in, or it might be trying to uh, question some of the things that I've said, and I'm happy for both of those uh, things. Skepticism is a different framing, but maybe of a similar type thing, where skepticism is part of those creative mindsets, as you've said, and I think as an as a ingredient of creativity, we can't accept anything at face value as well. That both of those, that that not accepting things at face value manifest themselves differently in the collaborative realm and in the creative realm, but are but are are equally uh, important in both. For me, skepticism, I tend to frame. I'm not a confrontational person, so I tend to frame my skepticism as, well, let's do an experiment, or I tend to frame my skepticism as, well, let me just play devil's advocate here. Or sometimes when I'm working with uh, some designers, I'll say, okay, now, how would you critique your own work? What do you feel like is missing from this work? And they'll start to identify things that they feel like problems, they, uh, aspects of the problem that they haven't solved yet. And that gives me a foundation that I can then uh, build on. Mm, so you, you use either like a design play, like a, like a, an interview or a, or a test to externalize 
um, some feedback on a particular piece of work or a line of questioning where you're trying to get the other person into a mindset of being reflective about what it is that they've created rather than going at it directly yourself. Right. right. Yeah, those are those are some excellent tactics uh, for the people that are listening to, okay. to deploy and to think about. This brings us to the last creative mindset, which mm. is humility. You've said, and I'm going to paraphrase here, that experience is often used as a mask for someone who has stopped learning. And that was what I was shamefully goading you into earlier um, in my question about your experience and what else could you possibly have to, to learn. Can you be seen as an expert, though, as an authority, while still being open with others that you don't know everything particularly in high stakes situations like executives? Yes. I don't know why, but yes. I mean, that's my, I never, I try never to feel like I must have the answer because I um, know that that is a recipe for humiliation, that it is, it will end up being more embarrassing if I try to make up an answer and more arrogant in a sense. Uh, if I try and make up an answer, uh, then simply say, you know what? I don't know but I know how I'm going to find out. I don't know the answer to that, but we should, we need to look into that. And I appreciate you bringing it up. Or I really want to hear what other people have to say. Humility is even when you have decades of experience, acknowledging the value of every voice in the room. And as I'm trying to learn voices that are not in the room, but humility is it's understanding that even if this person didn't do the homework, they've got something potentially meaningful and interesting to say, and they're not going to be penalized if they don't. They may be corrected. They may be, we may sort of discuss what, why their ideas don't have merit, but humility is acknowledging that there must be there, that in order for design to succeed, there must be a, uh, a level foundation, regardless of what we bring to the table initially. It's business that asks us, it's business that asks us to, that imposes decision makers and design needs to thrive in a business world, I guess. So it's business that says this person, because of their title, has been imbued with the power uh, to make a, a final decision. But my role in that is to provide that person with the best information that I can. And if that sometimes means I don't have the information, I need to go find it, then I am very comfortable saying I don't know. Just coming back to that notion of realizing that everybody's voice is, is able to be heard, even if you do have the most experience on a topic, it sounded like what you were saying is that while they might not necessarily be right, you leave the space open to the possibility that something that, that they might say might lead you to a different conclusion or change or shift your perspective or teach you something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That even if, even if, I mean, I don't know how your brain works, but when you're talking, I'm listening, I'm trying to listen to what you're saying, but I'm also sort of making other kinds of connections. And so all of that, that dialogue and the, the sort of, I don't know, fodder of that dialogue is, is the, is what nurtures, is what uh, nurtures design. Uh, as a process. And so I, I, it's, it's, um, the nutrition, right. Of, of design. So, um, that kind of conversation for everything we said about solitary work, ultimately there's getting all of those voices as many of them as we can and make sense of them, I think is what leads to better products. So speaking of getting more voices and leading to better products, you've recently started a video series and it's also a podcast called A Lens A Day mm. Conversations About Information Architecture. Yes. And literally, I was super impressed by this because I know how much work goes into just doing an episode a week. You've, you've been releasing literally an episode a day, which is just yes. phenomenal. And this is based on your set of cards that you right. created, your information architecture lenses. So I have, Why? I have a lot of things that Brendan does not have, which is uh, a, a deck of prompts that I can use and no desire to do as much research as you have done in this interview. <laughs> so <laughs> I basically told them, hey, I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions. My dad is an interviewer uh, by trade. Like he was a film professor, but what he was really, really known for was 
was was interviewing people who make movies and he was he is so good at it um and so that's my my interest in interviewing i think comes from watching him as a as a kid uh, and he would he would be uh appalled that i don't do any prep for those interviews because most of my childhood was watching him like do a tremendous amount of research uh, in advance of interviewing folks but yeah i i kept them short i uh asked the same basic set of questions i'm pretty good at thinking on my feet so they would say something and i would try and respond uh to that and i always had a lens that i could come to to kind of prompt a certain amount of of conversation so well, I'm taking notes. <laughs> Maybe I need to simplify my process. Oh, you are doing you are doing fantastic. I, I, it's, it's been a joy to have these conversations, given the amount of research that you've done. I mean, this is this just just to put the lenses aside for a second. Mm. When I talk about experience and how I'm sad that the industry as a whole does not value experience as much as it values, say, youth or novelty. It's because what comes with experience is the amount of research that you are drawing upon, right? I can, I can cook a meal without looking at a recipe because I've cooked literally hundreds of meals. Uh, and during the pandemic, it's basically all I've done is just every, there's a meal I got to go cook for the family. So I feel like that experience, there's value in that experience as well, because it allows us to ask to, to get to a depth that I don't normally get to get to when we're talking about this stuff, because because the interviewer has not necessarily done this, this amount of, of research. So it's sort of a meta illustration of why experience is so valuable because we are drawing, you're, you're drawing on a well that would not have been there without that experience of, of doing uh, the, the research that you've done. So thank you, you talked in, oh, you're most welcome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed researching for today, Dan. You're drawing on something that comes to mind from your talk at UX Australia last year, where you explored questions in depth, and yeah. we're not going to have time to go into that today no. in any detail, Can we do which is a shame. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Let's do another one. <laughs> but you, you talked about one of the particular types of questioning is to plumb the depths. Right. And that's definitely the, the approach that I take to Brave UX and the kind of questions and what I really love that I get from this. And what I was curious about with your new podcast series, A Lens A Day, was as the person who created the lenses, who's now interviewing other well-known, respected information architects who are also experts, some with comparable levels of experience to yourself, how has this process of having these conversations changed the way that you think about IA? Oh, what a good question. Um, and, and to be super clear, I did not just interview people with a lot of experience. I've spoke mm -hmm. to folks with maybe 10 years under their belt, maybe with two years under their belt. Uh, it was important to me to get a range of perspectives. So what I did not do in depth, I tried to overcompensate in breadth, right? And I felt like what 50 lenses gives me is an opportunity to talk to 50 different people and see lots and lots of uh, perspectives. To answer your question, I think it ended up, and maybe this was just uh, due to the format, but it validated my opinion about information architecture, which is that it's super important that there is a hunger to think about design problems at this level and that it thrives on collaboration. And if I were to say, I mean, those were sort of the themes that ended up emerging when I sort of think back on the highlights for me, it was, you know, the fact that whenever I asked people about process, it was always about asking questions of others. It was always about drawing other people into the, or, I mean, I specifically asked, how do you draw people into the process? But it was always about like the need and the value of having these conversations. It was always about trying to make things that are abstract more accessible so more people could uh, participate. It was always about curiosity. It was always about asking questions, uh, which was very gratifying for me because I've, I'm at my, my current, as you pointed out, my current topic of interest is how do we ask a good question? 
So I, I think I found it just very validating. So again, a very therapeutic exercise, selfishly therapeutic exercise for me. So. <laughs> but there's a tension in what we've talked about there, what you've just mentioned, you know, it was kind of gratifying and satisfying knowing that the practice of IA is being done in a way in which you believe it should be practiced, which hopefully isn't putting words in your mouth. But at, earlier on in our conversation, we talked about, you know, working with product teams and there are some fantastic designers within those product teams. But I got the sense that they were more tactical focused on UX and UI at a tactical level rather than the deep structure that exists in IA and some of the decisions that are monumental and the impact that they have at other layers of design. You know, there are a lot of thought-ish type articles out there on Medium and available for people to read, and they're not really breaking new ground and possibly reinforcing some bad um, practices or ways of thinking about IA. Where should truly curious, maybe early or mid-stage career UXs that realize that they have a bit of a deficiency in their IA skills, where should they go and or who should they go and listen to other than yourself for some really good critical thinking about how to apply IA more effectively in their design practice? Yeah, it's hard. I mean... There are some great books and what's amazing is that those books have withstood the test of time, right? There's the polar bear book, which I don't know if, if that's, you know, on the curriculum of, of a lot of these uh, boot camps, uh, cause it's meaty. There is, you know, Abby Covert's book, how to make sense of any mess. There's Lisa Maria Marquis's book, uh, everyday information architecture. Those are some newer entries into the field. And I, I feel like all of them have something interesting and worthwhile and meaningful uh, to say. I think the IA conference is still a, a fantastic event that is I'm is near and dear to my heart and attracts people who understand that how important IA is. And lest you think it is, you know, a bunch of middle-aged folks running around rehashing the glory days, Every year, it, half of the conference is brand new. Every year, half of the people who show up are people who have not been to this conference before. So what I love about it is it, it is this intense mixture of folks who have been doing this for decades and folks who are just discovering it uh, for the first time. And, I mean, just to build on that, many of the folks that I sort of mentor on the side, I met at a conference or I met at one person in particular I'm thinking of, uh, we met at the IA, IA Summit. Uh, it was called the Summit at the time. It's now called the IA Conference. But the thing that people have always loved about it is how accessible uh, we old timers are at that conference, right? We are attendees as well. Um, and I think there's just, whether you go to the IA Conference or any other conference, I think there's a... I think there's tremendous value in trying to meet some of these folks and have conversations with them because you never know where that uh, might might lead. But other sources, I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't. I don't know of. of well, any. I know. I know one. It's called a lens a day conversations <laughs> about information architecture, and I will be linking to your podcast and your video series, Thank Dan, you. in the show notes. Yeah, Thank you. It's a it's a, a wonderful resource for people who want to understand IA better and hear from a wide range of perspectives on that topic. Thank but, you. I was just going to say that I the the one surprise that uh, came out of it for me was. Well, probably one of many, but the main surprise that came out of that experience for me was how it was sort of a, it's now a time capsule of uh, IA in 2021. And it didn't occur to me uh, to think about it like that. It was literally just something for me to do over the summer. So, Well, no doubt it kept you occupied. <laughs> yes, that is true. Dan, I mentioned last year that you spoke at UX Australia. And just for people that want to check out that talk, it's called Questions, the Most Essential UX Tool. Mm. It was a great talk. Thanks. And there's so much in there that we need to go into another time. How to ask better questions and discovery is uh, such an important and essential topic for UXs. I really, really recommend you check it out, people. But Dan, if we just take that notion of asking questions and we zoom out a bit 
what questions, big questions, are we not asking enough of or trying hard enough to answer in the field of UX today? The questions that I'm asking myself more and more are, am I talking to the right people? And I guess I was sort of always asking that question, but I uh, feel like I'm asking it even more uh, now because if we just extend the metaphor of a lens, I feel like the lenses that I've been looking through have been clouded and it is time for me to sort of look more honestly about who I'm talking to, whether it's uh, research during the discovery process, whether it's a usability test, whether it's stakeholders, right? And who's, uh, who's involved. This comes from following the work of uh, Vivian Castillo and uh, Alba, uh, I'm gonna get her last name wrong, forgive me, uh, Villamil, I think. I saw Alba speak uh, at UXTC. She was fantastic. And Vivian has been doing just some amazing work on trying to lift up uh, the, the overall practice. So I follow the two of them on Twitter and, and just watching every tweet is, um, everything that I publish, everything that they write is, helps me open my eyes a, a little bit, a little bit more. I think uh, we also need to be asking ourselves about structure and what sits below this screen, what sits below you know, this interaction, what are, how are all the pieces uh, connected uh, to each other? How are the pieces uh, that are even not within my product connected to my product? Um, I think that is an extension of inclusivity is to sort of think about a more, think about our products in that more holistic way. So those are the two things that are top of mind as you ask me that question. Yeah, definitely big things for us as a community to reflect on and have a think about in our own time individually. Dan, this has been a great conversation. It's certainly given me plenty to reflect on and to think about, as I'm sure it has done for our audience as well. Thank you for so generously sharing your stories and insights today and for all the great contribution that you've made to the UX community over the past 25 or so years. Brendan, it was my great pleasure uh, chatting with you, and uh, I really appreciate the time as well. Thank you. You're most welcome. Dan, if people want to find out more about you, about Eight Shapes, about A Lens A Day, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, well, they can go to 8shapes.com to learn about uh, 8 Shapes, and uh, you can follow IA Lenses on Twitter, and I've been linking uh, every episode uh, there. Uh, if you go to anchor.fm slash a dash lens dash a dash day, a lens a day, uh, you can see the podcast version of a lens a day. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well and listen to this wonderful conversation. Everything that we've covered will be in the show notes, including where to find Dan, find Lens a Day and all the other great resources that we've spoken about. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX design and product management, don't forget to leave a review and also tell someone else about the show if you think they would get some value out of this conversation and conversations like it. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn under Brendan Jarvis. There's also a link to my LinkedIn profile in the show notes on YouTube, or you can head on over to thespaceinbetween.co.nz or NZ if you're in the US. And we know until mean. next time, <laughs> I'm glad you know what, what I mean. <laughs> I do wonder sometimes if anyone can actually understand me on this podcast. Um, until next time, keep being brave. <laughs>